As you're being seated, if you got your Bibles this morning, you can open them up to Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2, we're going to finish what we started in talking about marriage last week. And again, as I said, it, it won't be complete. I mean, there's so much you could do. There's, there, there's so much territory that you could go through. Uh, but there are some things that I definitely want to hit this week in terms of marriage before we keep going in the book of Genesis and we get to Genesis 3 and we see the fall in Genesis 3. But I got to tell you a funny story before we get started. Uh, last week, how many of y'all were here last week? All right, show of hands. Vast majority of y'all, okay. Um, did I make any of y'all feel awkward when I stared at you after the opening prayer? Any of y'all feel awkward for a little while? That, it was an intent. I, I tried to make you feel awkward. Uh, but my family is obviously here. You know, my wife and, and kids were sitting in the audience, and I made my wife feel a little awkward when I stared at y'all the way I did for the prolonged time, you know, before I started speaking. And she, you know, they told me the story afterwards, and, and she was like, oh, no, what is he doing? Like, what, what is he, what is he going to do? And my son was sitting with him, uh, with them, and he's at the Iron Man today serving over there. And and helping out with that, and, and he's like, Mom, here comes a movie quote. <laughs> like, 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 here it comes. It's just funny to me how well our families you know, know us, even our kids and our wives and things like that, and so I hope, I hope I made you feel awkward. I intended to do so, and if I didn't, I'll try harder next time, okay? I'll work at it until I get it right. All right, Genesis 2, uh, reminder, if you don't have a Bible when you come in, we're always passing them out out at the front door. Be glad for you to grab one, use it, even take it home with you if you need it, and you can always have that. I, I, love, to hear, uh, I love to hear your praises and your prayers, and I love to hear the pages flip too. You know, I just think it's a part of just a discipline you know, that we're going through the Scriptures and reasoning through it together. That's part of the reason I ask you all so many questions, is I want you all to be reasoning with me as we're going through the Scriptures, that it's not just a one one person thing with a, a big group of people. So all that being said, let's pray together and we'll open up the word and we'll get started. Father God, thank you for the opportunity to share your word with your people. And as always, Father, I confess that your Holy Spirit is the author of your word and your Holy Spirit is the helper that leads us to be able to interpret it. And I pray for a great amount of wisdom in interpreting your word today, a great amount of wisdom. And that, Father, that you would impute that wisdom uh, upon all of us as, as men and women and even as young people, Father, that you would give us that spiritual wisdom that we can apply to this specific context in terms of marriage because we see so much confusion and so much of a lack of wisdom in our society, in our culture, and yes, even in the church when it comes to marriage. So, Father... Grant us wisdom. Your word says that you grant it to those who ask and ask without doubting. And I'm confident that you want to bless that prayer because spiritual wisdom is a practical application of godly knowledge. And that's what we're doing right now, opening up your word to see what you say about these subjects and then that you would help us through your spirit to walk according to the truth of what we see. So lead us in the truth as we study your word. In the name of Christ we pray, amen. All right, a couple caveats, and I gave these to you last week as well, but one thing is, by the way, I'm speaking for two weeks on marriage with my wife sitting in the audience. Awkward, right? You know, like, she's going to be able to judge, like, everything that I say, okay? And today is going to be particularly interesting. I gave you all the PG-13 rating, you know, before you came in today, so we'll see where that goes, and, you know, discussions that we maybe have after church, I know, it could be fun, we'll see what happens, all right? Uh, but... I want y'all to know that I'm always preaching into the mirror, okay? I'm always preaching into the mirror, and today that'll be particularly applicable as we think about marriage, you know, in conversations that we may have about these things too, okay? So always preaching in the mirror, not throwing rocks at anybody, but thinking about myself in these things as well. I'll also say this, this is going to be a no politically correct zone today. This will not be a politically correct message. It's just not going to be, okay? I'm going to try to stick according to the interpretation that I see in Scripture. I'm going to try not to worry about all the other things that are going around in our culture, okay? And if you want to have conversations to talk about those things, I'm open to that. I'm, I'm open to having those types of conversations and talking through them, but I'm not going to worry about that. Now, I am going to try not to be dogmatic about things that are not dogmatic. Y'all know what I'm saying? When I see things that are rules of thumb, I'm going to try to identify that as opposed to having a, putting down a black and white on everything, and I'm going to try the best I can as a teacher okay, to be discerning with where I put down the black and white and where you know, we leave a little bit of wiggle room and identify rules of thumb versus making 100% dogmatic types of statements. And then the last thing I will say is, 
I would just exhort you to listen all the way through, okay? I have been in the same position as you are, where I will listen to messages sometimes and maybe hear something that I don't like or disagree with, and then I'll shut it down right there. Have y'all done that before? I've done that too, okay? And we'll probably all do it again in the future. I'm just going to exhort you to listen all the way through to see if these things come together and then make your decision based on the whole picture rather than just one statement or one part of it. Fair enough? That's, that's all I'm asking there is to listen all the way through. Okay, so uh, before we get into it, one thing I want you all to be aware of is the pictures and the symbolism that are going to be inherent in all the things that we're going to talk about today in these scriptures. I want you to watch for the pictures. I want you to look for the symbolism that's in here. Now, we're in the South. We're in Cleveland, Tennessee. How many of y'all are football fans? Football fans, okay. I have to apologize to the non-sports people in here. If this is going to be your church, you're going to hear a lot of sports illustrations over the years. There's nothing I can do about it. It's just nothing. It's just in there, and it's going to come out. I cannot help it. If that offends you, you might have to look for another church. I mean, I mean, I just, I just can't do anything about it. Like, it's just in there, and, it, and it's going to come out. When I think about symbolism, you know what the first thing I think about is? I think about the coaches on the sideline signaling in plays at a football game. Have y'all noticed over the last few years how they have, a lot of teams have stopped all the hand signals, and they've gone to all the signs? Have y'all seen that? Like, they have signs of cartoon characters and musicians and buildings and all kinds of inanimate objects and, you know, all kinds of things, and they signal them in, and you're like, well, what does all this stuff mean? I mean, you, you could have some coaches over on the sideline holding up four cards, and a lot of times they have multiple cards, and it could be like a, a, a fork, a, a, a Rolex watch, um, a, a chicken, and... And, the, and the, you know, the players are out on the field, and they're looking intently at the cards. And, and if you took that literally, like, what would that mean? Like, team dinner, Sesame Street. Like, is that what you're trying to tell me? What, what are you trying to communicate? And the, and the, the you know, quarterback looks at it, and it's like, okay. And he like goes back to the huddle. Here's the game plan, guys. Fried chicken tonight at 9 o'clock. Dude, that's awesome. And we're watching Sesame Street. Yes! That's what I'm talking about. No, that's not what it means. It's symbolic. It represents something. It tells them it communicates other information through symbolism and the connections that you make with these symbols. And they understand that ahead of time. Now, is there some of that in marriage? Absolutely yes. And if you haven't seen all the symbolism and if you haven't made all the connections, then it's likely that you could be missing the heart in what marriage is and in how God designed it and what purpose He intends it for. And all the individual pieces of marriage share that too. So I want you to keep in mind the symbolism and all the pictures that God has designed and created to point us back to Jesus, to point us back to Him, and all the things that we're going to be talking through today. Now, we read these scriptures, but we're going to read them again because I think the repetition is very, very healthy. But we're going to spend the majority of our time in a couple of passages that complement Genesis 2 today that you just can't get around when you're thinking about issues that are relevant to marriage. So let's start back in Genesis chapter 2, verse 4. This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created. In the day that the Lord God made earth and heaven. Now class, most of y'all were here last week. What did I tell y'all the big difference was between the account of creation in Genesis 1 and the account we see in Genesis 2? What's the big difference? Genesis 2 focuses on more what aspect of creation? Man, okay? You're taking the wide angle lens in Genesis 1 with all the different aspects of creation. And in Genesis 2, you're narrowing it down and you're focusing more on the creation of man and woman and the relationship that God ordained for them to have. So you focus down in a lot compared to chapter 1, verse 5 in chapter 2. Now no shrub of the earth, no shrub of the field was yet in the earth, and no plant of the field had yet sprouted, for the Lord God had not sent rain upon the earth, and there was no man to cultivate the ground. But a mist used to rise from the earth and water the whole surface of the ground. Then the Lord God formed the man, formed man of dust from the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. Now let me ask you a very simple question. This man, is it talking about mankind as in men and women, or is it talking about an individual? Who is created right here in Genesis 2-7? It's talking about Adam, okay? 
We're talking about one person, literally man, not mankind, okay? Now you're like, why does that matter? Just stick with me, okay? We'll fill in the blanks as we go. We'll fill in the gaps as we go. But I need you to understand, if you look at the context, Adam was created first. It's going to be very easy to see as we continue walking through Genesis 2. And I'm making a point by just pointing that out. And we'll start to tie it up in just a minute. Verse 8. The Lord God planted a garden toward the east in Eden. There he placed the man whom he had formed. Who did he put in the garden first? The man. He put Adam in there. Okay? And he's going to give him some commands. Out of the ground the Lord God caused to grow every tree that's pleasing to the sight and good for food. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden. And the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now a river flowed out of Eden to water the garden, and from there it divided and became four rivers. The name of the first is Pishon. It flows around the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold. The gold of that land is good. The delium, the onyx stone are there. The name of the second river is Gihon. It flows around the whole land of Cush. By the way, have I told you all yet with the rule for reading all the biblical names? Just go for it. That's right. Just go for it and go for it confidently and act like you know what you're talking about. Okay, there you go. All right, so keep going. Verse uh, 14, the name of the third river is Tigris. It flows east of Assyria. The fourth river is the Euphrates. Then the Lord God took who and put him in there? The man and put him into the Garden of Eden to cultivate it and keep it. The Lord God commanded the who? The man saying from any tree of the garden you may eat freely, but from the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat from it you will surely die. Then the Lord God said, it is not good for man to be alone. I will make him a helper suitable or compatible like we talked about last week. I will make him a helper suitable, compatible for him. So who was created first? Adam was. Who was put in the garden first? Adam was. Who was given the law first? Adam was. Who was given the responsibility to cultivate the garden first? Adam was. Simple questions, right? What's the point? Okay. Well, here's what it comes to mind. And we're going to talk about this passage in just a moment, so bear with me. You think about Ephesians 5, and it says, The husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church. Now, what's the point? Okay, here's the point. And I want you to think about this in terms of the character of God and not just the roles of men and women in the context of marriage. I want you to think for a moment about the character of God. Is God a God of order or a God of disorder? He's order. He's a God of order. What are you talking about? Well, look at the manner of creation. Here's what I did on day one. Here's what I did on day two. Here's what I did on day three. Here's what I did on day four. All the way to day seven, and then I rested. Here's what I did. And he spells it all out for us. How about the law? If you want to read through Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy and all that kind of stuff, you know, that'd be a blessing, right? Let's go read through all that right now. What did he do? He said, here's what you can eat. Here's what you can't eat. Here's how you do worship. Here's how you don't worship, okay? He's a God of order. He set the framework for holiness for his people because he's a God of order. How about the worship? The tabernacle in the book of Exodus. He said, here's how I want you to do it, Moses. I'm going to give you a pattern. The pattern says you make it this big. You make it with these materials. Everything's this far apart. You build it exactly like this. Here's the specs, okay? Here's who you're going to use as contractors, I'm seeing some of my buddies down front. I got all these kind of terms I don't know anything about coming to mind right now. Okay. All right. I don't know if I'll use them right. Don't criticize me. Okay. Don't worry about it. He says, here's how you're going to do all this. And by the way, when you come in, you're going to come in here and the bronze labor is going to be here. And here's how you use it for worship. And then here's going to be the bronze altar or bronze altar first. And then the bronze labor sacrifice here, wash here. Then you go into the next room and over here to the right is the table of showbread. There's the altar of incense. You know, there's the, you know, there, there's the menorah over here and so the lampstand is over here you can have bread continually over here incense continually over here lit continually then the next room is going to be the holy of holies that's where the ark you're like that's kind of specific why because god is a god of order that that's who he is look in the new testament okay Romans chapter 13, for example, he says, uh, he's talking about government, by the way, and he's, he's telling us what the purpose of government is. And he says, don't you know that all authority on heaven and earth is whose authority? 
God's authority. And he's setting in order, and he's saying government is supposed to work in this way so that it maintains order. Government is here to protect the citizens by punishing the evildoer. It maintains order here. All authority is God's authority on heaven and on earth. Then you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 13, and 14. And he's kind of, Paul is kind of admonishing the church at Corinth because they're getting a lot of stuff done in the church through the exercising of all the spiritual gifts. But he says, man, y'all need to have some order up in here. Like, we, we need a little bit of peace in here and a little bit of order so people can understand what's going on and God can be worshipped in the midst of all the things that are happening here. You see it from the beginning of the word to the end of the word that God is a God of order. So I need you to understand, when we go into the roles of husbands and wives, it's a reflection of the character of God. Nothing in here is going to be setting one in God's economy as being greater than versus one being less than. It's God establishing order because that's who God is. And then you're even going to see how the roles reflect back a picture of God and his relationship with Christ and even his relationship with the church. There's a picture here. That God is a God of order. And he establishes it from the very beginning in his manner of creation. So, all that being said, we've just seen now that Adam has been created first. I'm trying to help you see a window into the heart of God as to why there was even any kind of order here, okay, in terms of when they were born. Because, by the way, for those that weren't here last week, are men and women equals? Yes. Because why? Help me out. Both created in whose image? The image of God, Genesis 1, okay? They're equals, but they're just different. They're equals, but they have different roles, okay? All right, so, so let's talk about Ephesians chapter 5, because we just saw that God said, hey, you're alone, it's not good for you to be alone, I will make you a helper suitable or compatible to you. Okay, I think this relates to Ephesians chapter 5. So why don't you turn there with me? Because we're going to spend some time in Ephesians 5 this morning. I'm not just going to flip over from it really quickly. And then we'll go back into Genesis chapter 2. And let's talk about what these roles are in a very honest way. And try to find the picture of these things as they relate to marriage in Ephesians chapter 5. Now, I'm going to back up and start a verse earlier than what you hear at most weddings you go to. Okay, I'm going to start one verse earlier than what you usually hear and read at a wedding. Ephesians 5, verse 21. And be subject to, or your version may say, submit to, one another in the fear of Christ. This is an exhortation to the body of the church, men and women, to submit to one another. So I need you to understand, submit is not a bad word. Be subject to is not a bad word. We are all told to regard each other in that way in the church. We're all told to submit to one another in the church. Then it gets specific in terms of the wife's role and the husband's role in the context of marriage. Verse 22. Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the Savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. Okay, now, if you've been around here at all, you know I'm going to ask a bunch of questions, okay? Now, for y'all that know me a little bit, when I ask questions, do I actually want y'all to answer me? I really do. Like, I want y'all to talk to me, okay? So I'm giving you permission to talk and to answer my questions as we kind of go. All right, so here we go. What is the specific role that God gives wives in the context of marriage? What is it? Just tell me what the scripture says. I'm not asking you to interpret it. What does it say? Be subject to your husbands, okay? Some of your translations may say submit to your husbands, okay? Would y'all agree that there would be some, uh, would y'all agree that there would be some relationship to respect your husbands in that context? Yeah, okay? Yeah, yeah, I definitely think so. I think there's a manner of respect there. Now, this is the command that God specifically gives wives as opposed to husbands, gives wives in relationship with their husbands. Be subject to, submit to, respect your husbands. What does that mean? It means allowing the husband to lead, to take leadership, okay? We're going to see the husband's role here in just a minute. 
What else does it mean? I want you to think about this a little bit differently. I'm pretty confident that most of you all have heard these verses, okay, and you have some thoughts on them. I want you to think about this a little bit differently now. Wives, think about something. What does it tell you, what does it teach you about your husband? Single folks, you know, if, if you're a woman in here and you're thinking about the future, what does it tell you about the need of men because of the role that you are given as women? What does that tell you? Listen, God designed men. He designed us. And he designed women. So the designer of men looks at women. And he says, in the context of husband, be subject to, submit to, or respect your husbands. What does that tell you about men? We need it. We need your respect. Okay? I'm not saying we want it. I'm not saying we hope to have it. I'm not saying that maybe one day we'll be able to achieve it. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about need. From a spiritual, like, root level, we need your respect. And I got to tell you something. When, when you demonstrate respect to us, I'm just telling y'all as a man, it feels really good. You're like, oh. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. That, that feels good. I'm not talking about oppressive. I'm not talking about abusive. I'm talking about from the manner in which God has designed us, when we sense that our wives respect us, it feels good to us. It empowers us. It builds us up. It encourages us. It makes us feel loved. How can I love my husband? Give him respect, man. He'll love it. He'll feel loved. I'm just telling you. That is the way it is. Why? Because God designed us in that way. So in the role that he gave you as women, he's teaching you something about men. And men, y'all need to understand that. We need to understand that, that this is something that God created us with a desire for. And God is trying to satisfy it through the act of marriage and through the specific role that he has given women. Now, women, listen to me. Hold on for a second. By the way, I'm coming to the men. Y'all know I'm getting there in a minute. I'm not going to be like, all right, this is women's deal. Let's peace out. We'll see y'all next week, Genesis 3. Now we're getting to the men too. But women, think about something. Okay, here's the question. And I told y'all last week, I wanted these two weeks to be what I would tell people in counseling situations. Premarital, okay? You know, postmarital, doesn't, doesn't really matter. I wanted this to be the Word of God counseling to us about our ideas about marriage and, and, and dealing with our hearts in these things. So ladies, let me ask you a question. According to the scripture, what is it that gives you the ability to submit to or respect your husbands? Look at the passage. Look at the scripture. Okay. According to the scripture, what gives you the ability, what equips you to be able to submit to or respect your husbands? Look at the passage. Verse 22. Wives, be subject to your own husbands as what? To the Lord. Okay? What's your point, Richie? All right, here's, I'm glad you asked. All right, here, here's the point. Okay? Your manner of submission and respect to your husband is not dependent on their worth. It is not dependent on their value. It's not dependent on their leadership. It's not dependent on how well they love you. It's not dependent on how good they treat you. It's not dependent on how much money they bring home, how attractive they are. It's not dependent on any of those things. You understand what I'm saying? Your ability to submit to and respect your husband is completely contingent on your intimate relationship with God. And he's saying you submit to your husband as you're in submission to the Lord. So what you start to realize is if you don't have the ability to submit to your husband, it's not necessarily his fault. It shows you that there's a heart condition that you got to get fixed on your own. You're not walking in submission before God. All right, now, I didn't just say your husband deserved submission. I didn't say that. Did y'all hear me say that? Anybody hear me say that? Did y'all hear me say that? Jeff, did you hear me say that? All right, nobody heard me say that. But y'all know why nobody heard me say that? Because I didn't say that. It doesn't mean your husband is worthy of your respect. That's missing the whole point. And that's why our culture has gotten so far away from these things. You're going to see the same thing with, with husbands here in just a minute. Ladies, what I need you to understand is you do have the capacity to do this. But it's completely contingent on you being intimately connected with your Father God. It's dependent on your intimacy with God, not on how valuable or worthy your husband is. Okay? That is what can fuel you, you fulfilling this command. Verse 23. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, 
he himself being the Savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their husbands and everything. God has created an order in marriage. All right, now let me stop for a second. I'll give you all one more caveat before we get on to the husbands. You have some of you are like, man, please, come on, call the husbands out. Let's do this. We're getting there, okay? Well, what's the other caveat? I don't know. I forgot the other caveat. <laughs> and that, that's the honest to goodness truth. I'm being serious to y'all. I just forgot the other caveat. <laughs> no awkwardness except for me. Okay. All right. So let's keep going. It's time to get to the husbands. Maybe that's the Holy Spirit saying, Richie, you said you were going to get on the husbands. Go ahead and get on the husbands. You forgot what you're going to say to the wives. Go ahead and deal with the husbands. Husbands, here we come. Verse 25. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her, so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by washing of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. So husbands ought also to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church. All right, now I remembered my caveat while I was reading the verses, so I'm going to have to share it. I'm sorry, I apologize. Here's the thing. I want you all to know there's only two places in Scripture that I know that put an order in terms of men and women's dynamics, okay? The only two places that I can see in Scripture where any order is given between men and women is in marriage and in church leadership. That's it. So what does that mean? It means when I tell you guys that I believe that men and women are equal, it means can a woman be a business owner or a CEO? Yes. Can a woman be the president of the United States of America? Yes. Can a woman do anything else in our society as well as or better than a man can? Yes. Why? Because we're equals. There are only a couple places where God has given a spirit of order. And that's part of what I need you all to understand is that different roles does not mean less than. And if the culture has convinced you of that, then you're believing something that's not true and that is not according to God's economy. Okay? That was the caveat. I felt like it was important to say, even though my mind left me for a minute. All right? So, let's go to the husbands. Husbands, y'all are up. Tell me specifically what is the command that you are given to address and to, to feel in terms of your role in marriage towards your wives. What are you supposed to do? Love. love. You feel like one word. Love. Love in what manner, by the way? As Christ loved and gave himself up for the church. All right, so here's the question. Y- y'all got, y'all kind of already got the heads up because I dealt with the ladies first because it came in that order in the scripture, all right? But think about it. What is your manner of love contingent on what fills you, what gives you the ability to love your wife as Christ loved the church? What is it according to the scripture? Are y'all looking? What is it? It's how, uh, it's how attractive your wife is. It's how well she serves you. It's how well she submits to you. It's how much respect she gives you. It's what she does around the house. It's how she takes care of the kids. It's how great she does at her job and how she's recognized. It's what she achieves. It's those things, right? That's what gives you the capacity to love your wife, correct? No. What gives you the capacity to love your wife? It's the manner in which Christ loved you. Let me ask you a question. When did Christ love you? Like, when did he die for you? Romans 5, when you were still in sin, right? Unconditional sacrificial, not emotional, okay, based on a decision, not on an emotion. You understand what I'm saying? So husbands, no matter what your wife does, no matter if she respects you or not, no matter how she honors you or dishonors you or anything else, do you still have the capacity to love your wife and give yourself up for her sacrificially? Yes or no? Yes, you do. But it's completely dependent upon your intimacy with your Heavenly Father that He would fuel you with that love. It's not based on her worth or her value or her achievement or any other thing. You understand what I'm saying? This is what we have to understand in the church. Because what couples do in our culture is that they, fa- they, stay, they think they fall out of love with each other. And what they always want to do is blame the other person. My wife doesn't respect me. This is what she says about me. She nags me. She does this. She doesn't do this for me. She doesn't give me that. 
And the wife says, well, he does this, and he's ugly to me, and he doesn't love me, and he withholds things from me, and he doesn't respect me, and he talks down to me, and he talks ugly, and he does all this. And we're kind of like, well, why don't we just worry about our own self, right? Why don't I, as a husband, why don't I start looking in the mirror and focus on how I'm loving my wife as opposed to what she is or isn't doing? Now, is that simple? Is that simple? Actually, it is. Is it easy? No, it's not easy. I'm not trying to sell y'all something and say, hey, this is just so easy. You just do this. This is no problem. You got this figured out. No big deal. No big thing. You got this. I'm not saying it's easy like that, but I am saying it's simple. We have to look in the mirror and take ourselves into account and see what we're, what our role is in the context of our marriages and stop pointing fingers at the other person all the time. And we have the ability to do it through the presence of the Holy Spirit because you've seen in the Scripture it's contingent on our relationship with God and not on the relationship with the other person. What they do, what they don't do, what they bring to the table, or what they don't bring to the table. Ladies, I also want you to think about something in terms of the order and submission in this, in this relationship within the context of marriage. And I want to remind the guys, too, is there anything in here that would lead you to think that this type of relationship should be abusive or manipulating uh, or you know, lording authority over the other one in any way, shape, form, or fashion based on what we're told? No. I'm just telling you that would be a perversion of the principles that are here. Y'all got to remember, the Bible is a big book, right? You have to interpret every individual piece of Scripture along with all the rest that is written. We mentioned this last week, but in Matthew chapter 20, 25 through 26, Jesus said the Gentiles lord their authority over each other. They use it to press down. They use it to crush. They use it to get what they want. But for you, to be the greatest, you got to be the least. You have to serve others and lift them up. So I need you to understand that the more leadership responsibility that you're given in God's economy, the more service that you're called to. You understand what I'm saying? Men, you have to interpret being the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church as a servant leader position. This is not used to press. It is not used to crush. It is not used to manipulate. It is not used to degrade. It is not used to any of those things. And that's part of the reason the culture doesn't like these things is because men for generations have used them in that way and have abused the roles that God has designed and have stepped out from what God has called us to do. And now people are pushing back on the whole thing. You understand what I'm saying? Some of y'all have had that happen in your lives. It has happened to you personally. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to really ask you not to throw the baby out with the bathwater. You know what I'm saying? We're imperfect people. It, it, marriage for us is not a perfect process. But man, look at the picture. L- look at the picture. The picture is beautiful. The picture is a reflection of God and a reflection of God's heart. Men, you know how I did this with the women a little bit earlier, you know, talking about the men. Men, what does this command teach you about your wife and about women in general? If you're told, if God, your designer and the designer of women, has told you, here's your one utmost role above all other things, love your wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for for you, what does that teach you about a woman? She needs it. She needs it. She doesn't just want it. She doesn't just hope to have it. She needs it. And an absence of it will hurt her almost to the point of not being able to be able to be repaired. It is destructive. It is destructive for a man not to feel respected and be respected in a marriage. It is destructive for a woman not to be loved in the context of marriage. God has given you something greatly to steward and to privilege in the context of marriage. For you single folks, that's what he's calling you to if he ever calls you to be married. He's calling you to steward the heart of the other person in a very wise way. And not to do so will be disastrous for them. You understand what I'm saying? This teaches us about each other. It teaches us also about the heart of God. It goes on to say in Ephesians 5 verse 30, because we are members of his body. For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is great, but I am speaking with reference to Christ and the church. What is the symbolic picture of marriage between any normal man and woman? It's a picture of the relationship between Christ and the church. 
That's what it is. It's a practical symbol of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what marriage is supposed to be. Okay? Just in terms of the man being the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church is a picture of God in the sense that he's a God of order and not of disorder. Marriage and the roles of men and women, you've been given a specific command that demonstrates a specific picture of who God is in the nature of Jesus Christ. Steward that. Man, be excited about that. We've been given different roles and different parts of the character of God and the character of Christ to show with other people. We'll come back to that thought at the very end. Now let's go back to Genesis 2 really quickly. Finish out the chapter and look at one more passage. Genesis 2, 19. God has just finished telling them, hey, you're alone. This isn't good. I'm going to make you a helper that's compatible to you. Someone who's your equal. Someone y'all can have you know, a conversation and you can agree on things. And y'all can rule the world together that I've given you. You can be stewards of what I've created. Verse 19, out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field, every bird of the sky, and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called a living creature, that was his name. The man gave names to all the cattle and to the birds of the sky, to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper suitable for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept. Then he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh at that place. The Lord God fashioned into a woman the rib which he had taken from the man and brought her to the man. The man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Okay? Again, some of your translations for join says cleave. Okay? It means to adhere to, be stuck together in a way that they would never be broken apart. Verse 25, and the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Okay? Now, here's where we're going to go to, to the other passage that we're going to look at this morning. Why don't you flip over to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. We're going to start, start this off in verse 15. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 15. Okay? We've got the man and his wife. They're joined together to become one flesh. And then it says that they were naked and they were not ashamed. Now, when I told you all that I wanted to address marriage in the context of counseling... There are three huge issues that, that encapsulate the vast majority. Even all the small ones, you can kind of bring them back to this. But there are three huge issues that you usually deal with when you counsel married couples. Okay? You're, you're talking about spiritual leadership, okay? the, the roles within the context of marriage, spiritual leadership. Then you're talking about finances, and you're talking about sex. Okay? You can't, you can't get away from that. That's one of the things that creates a lot of division and a lot of problems within the context of marriage. So I warned you guys ahead of time, here comes the PG-13 part of our conversation today. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 15. Do you not know that your, your bodies are members of Christ? Hey, y'all remember the picture now? Remember, remember the picture? Okay, keep, keep that in mind. Shall I then take away the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? May it never be. Or do you not know that the one who joins himself to a prostitute is one body with her? For he says, the two shall become one flesh. Let me ask you a question real quick. Back in Genesis 2, when he said the two shall become one flesh, was there any allusion to sex in that reference? Thank you. Like, were y'all were y'all afraid to say it? Like I don't know what I should say. You know, just, just I don't know. of course there was. Like yeah, okay. Let me ask you a different question. Was sex happening before the fall? Yes, yes it was. Okay, don't don't be ashamed. Going, I don't know what to do right now. You know, like I'm already. You know, we don't talk. We don't talk about this in church. That's part of the problem, y'all. You know what I'm saying? That, that we don't talk about it in church in, in a healthy way, except to say, oh, it's bad. It's evil. It's wicked, it's gross, it's dirty, it's perverse. Like, let's, let's don't, just don't talk about it. Like, sweep it under the rug. Let's don't talk about that kind of stuff. Come on, y'all. All right, let, let's get it. Y'all loosen up a little bit. Like, stand up, do some stretches, you know, or something like that. And loosen up a little bit. We're, we're going to have to get in here. We're going to have to talk about it a little bit. Was that something that was in the picture before the fall? Yes. Did God create us with a sex drive? Yes. And then he put Adam and Eve in the garden called Delight. And they were naked and unashamed. Y'all know what I'm saying? Yeah, I th I'm kind of thinking it might be in there somewhere. All right? I mean, I'm not real fast on the uptake, but I think it was there. 
Verse 17, 1 Corinthians 6. But the one who joins himself to the Lord is one spirit with him. Now, y'all know I reminded y'all the picture again. That word joins is the Greek equivalent of the Hebrew word joins all the way back in Genesis 2. It's the same thing. Joins, cleaves, adheres to. What is marriage a picture of? It's a picture of the fact that you are joined inseparably in the body of Christ. That you're adopted as his sons and daughters. That you are one with him. That's what your marriage represents. That's how big it is. That's what it's supposed to show people. That's why it's so important. You understand what I'm saying? That's what your marriage proclaims to people. They don't even understand it a lot of times. I didn't understand the importance of this until we used to do youth ministry. And kids would just want to be around us. Around you doing what? Like jumping on things and throwing things and, you know, having fun? No, like around you when you change diapers, you know, and spank your kids. Not that I would ever do that, but, you know, and, and, you know, it's not biblical. Okay, that's all another thing. Just just kidding, just kidding. Don't don't follow me there. All right, so when you're doing normal stuff, when you're cooking dinner, when you're doing stuff, just want to be around you like that. Why? Because it's it's healing. Because it, 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 it promotes the gospel. Because they're seeing attitudes and reflections of Christ and the relationship with God and His people in the context of your marriage. And they just need to be around that because they've seen a lot of pain and destruction in their marriage. This is all a picture of the gospel. Let that exhort you in your marriage. Let that cause you to, even if there's some unforgiveness, to try to seek forgiveness and reconciliation and to seek to look in the mirror to see how you can fulfill your role because of what God's trying to do in and through your marriage. Verse 18, flee immorality. Every other sin that a man commits is outside the body, but the immoral man, well, he sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? For you have been bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. Now we're going to elaborate on this in just a minute. What I need you to understand is Paul is dealing with a very immoral church in Corinth. Okay, back in 1 Corinthians 5, you had a dude who was hooking up with his stepmom. And then in chapter 6, you learn that people in the church are sleeping with prostitutes. And he's saying, guys, y'all got to understand, you are united. If you're a believer, you are united with Christ. And you have to understand that when you have sex with somebody, you are united with them in a way that demonstrates the picture of your unity with God. Should you go out and do that with a prostitute? Or any person that is not your wife or husband? No. Remember what this is. Remember what it represents, okay? And then he goes on to say that the seriousness of immorality, and by the way, immorality is the, is the Greek, I don't always share Greek words, but y'all are going to get this one. Immorality is the Greek word pornea. What do we get from that word? Pornography. Immorality, by context and by definition, is Any sexual expression, I'm going to say it one more time, three-letter word, real easy to get, any sexual expression outside of the marriage bed. You understand what I'm saying? That's what it is. He says any sexual expression outside of marriage, y'all, that's sin against your own body. He's telling us that the consequences, and you have to be real careful when you start ranking sin, like, this sin's really bad. This sin's not really a big deal. This is respectable sin, all right? You, know, these aren't, you have to be real careful when you talk about ranking sins. But does Paul put a special emphasis on immorality as a sin? Yeah, he does, okay? Is immorality particularly destructive? Yeah, it really is. It's destructive to us, and it's destructive to those around us. And it's not a picture in the image that God wants us to show as it's related to marriage. He's designed one specific expression for this in a very particular order for a very specific reason. It's a, I know you don't think of it in this sense, but y'all, sex is a picture of the gospel. It is. You're like, uh, what? Yeah, I don't really think about it like that. I get it, but it is. But it is. And in the right context, it's holy, and it's good, and it's ordained, and it's a gift from God, and it's all those kinds of things. And I say that for a very specific reason. Now, verse 7, or chapter 7, verse 1. Now, concerning the things about what you wrote, okay, the Corinthians, because of all the immorality in the church, they were confused, and they had written a letter to Paul to ask him some questions, okay? And so what Paul's doing right now is he's writing to address their questions, 
And y'all are going to see how this group of people, and this is what human nature does, it causes us to swing on the pendulum from one side of things all the way to the other. These Corinthian Christians have been surrounded by immorality even in the church. And watch what they did as a result. Now concerning the things about what you wrote, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Okay, Just so you know, when he says touch a woman, he's talking about sexual relationship. But because of immoralities, each man is to have his own wife, and each woman is to have her own husband. The husband must fulfill his duty to his wife, and likewise also the wife to her husband. Why don't y'all write that in a, in a card sometime? You know, that's the most like, doesn't that sound like the most unromantic expression of a sexual relationship ever? ever? Fulfill your duty. Like, oh, the sweet words you speak to me. Like, you really know how to, you know. No, it, it doesn't, okay? What does that mean, duty? It means what's owed, okay? It means what's owed. So Paul's literally telling us in this scripture that, that the wife is owed sexual satisfaction from the husband, and the husband is owed sexual satisfaction from the wife. Now, be careful with that, okay? We're going to come back to that in a minute. And remember, I've already qualified this with the roles in marriage. Do you or have you seen anything in Scripture that would lead you to believe that any of this is supposed to be used to abuse or oppress? Absolutely not. It's a big book. You've got to take it all into context together. But that's not even what's happening in this Scripture. And I don't blame some of y'all or some of y'all saying, what? Fulfill your duty. What? Okay. Look at the next verse, verse 4. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise, also the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Some of you are like, shut your mouth. What did you just say to me? I, I didn't say it. D- did I write the book of 1 Corinthians? Nope. I didn't do it. I, I mean, according to my understanding, the Holy Spirit wrote it. Through, he just used Paul as like the, the vessel of clay that was holding the pen. Y'all know what I'm saying? What are you talking about? The husband doesn't have authority over his own body, but the wife does? The wife doesn't have authority over her own body, but the husband does? Uh-uh. Like, no, that, nah, that's not going down. That's not the way this thing is supposed to work. Look at the picture. Verse 5. Stop depriving one another except by agreement for a time, so that you may devote yourselves to prayer and come together again so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Here's what was going on in Corinth. The, the, the Christian, you know, the really, the remnant, the, the really committed parts of the church were looking at all the immorality, and they were going, man, sex is destructive and it's bad. Maybe we should just not do it. Let, let's, just, let's just stay away from it. And Paul's like, do What? That, like, this is designed for your protection. Like, because, because immorality is so enticing and because of the, 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 the feelings and, the, and the, the sex drive that God has given us, we need a place for expression. This is the place for expression. This is a godly part of a godly relationship because it is in the manner that the God of order put it in order. This is your best protection against immorality. Stop depriving each other. Like, don't, don't swing all the way over there and say, oh, it's wicked, it's bad, it's gross, it's perverted, so we're not, we're not going we're not gonna to see, we're not going to hear, we're not going to talk about it, we're not going to... No, don't, don't go over there. Stop depriving one another. He even gave them rules. He said, stop depriving one another except by agreement. you got to both agree. He says, for a time... Now, y'all, you know, put your reading context hats on, okay? When he says for a time, is he meaning long time or short time? Short time. It's very easy to read in the context there. And he says, for the purpose of prayer. That's it. Like, that's it. That's the only reason why you should stop in the context of marriage. That you agree, you know, that it'd be for a very short time, and it'd be for the purpose of prayer. It's kind of like a fast. You don't fast for the purpose of denying yourself. Man, I didn't eat breakfast today. I'm way more holy than you are. No, I'm probably more sinful than you are if I didn't eat breakfast. You know? You're supposed to use that in the context of a fast for the purpose of using that time for food preparation and the time of eating for, for seeking intimacy with God and spending time with Him. Same thing here. So what Paul's takeaway, his picture, the overarching picture that he gives us for sex in the context of marriage is this. Serve each other like you don't exist for you. She, she doesn't exist. You give yourself to her. She gives herself 
to you. You serve each other. You don't lord anything over each other. And remember this, going back to 1 Corinthians, okay, I'm sorry, going back to Ephesians chapter 5. Did God give the husband any command to try to force or make the wife respect him? If you go back and read it, you won't find it because it's not there. He was given a personal command to love. Was the wife given any command to demand the love of the husband? No, she was given a personal command to respect him, to submit to him. That's it. So that relationship doesn't exist for one to lord something over the other. It's something that's supposed to take and be taken personally. Not that you would exact it from the other person. The sexual relationship's the same way. Yes, are we owed technically in the context of marriage? Yeah, both of us are equally, okay? How do we get there? You serve me, I serve you. We serve each other. You don't demand it from the other person. You see what I'm saying? That's the context that it's presented to us in. And if you really think it through, it's a really beautiful thing because you exist to sacrifice on behalf of each other and to serve each other. And in the context of a relationship where both of you are sacrificial and both of you are service-oriented, then what's happening for each of you? You're both being served. You're both being satisfied. You understand what I'm saying? Like, that's how the picture works. Like, look at this thing. We've got to stop pushing back on all these things and understand, y'all, if marriage really functioned like this, how good would it be? If marriage really functioned like this, how good it would be? If the man focused on loving and serving, if the wife focused on respecting and submitting, if they served each other in the physical relationship in this sense, how good would marriage be? It would be so good. And at that point, who's going to want to step outside? You know what I'm saying? How do we protect ourselves? Let's fulfill our roles in the way that God designed it. This is how it works. And this is how we reflect the heart of God. Now, we're going to hit a couple of other things as we go through this. I'll give you some application points. I kind of saved them to the end and make a couple other points on these things. So if you got your pens and pencils, if you got your notepads, let's take some of these things now. First thing right here, quickly as possible. The roles in marriage are uniquely designed to picture the gospel. That's the heart. That's the heart of these things. The roles are uniquely designed for women and uniquely designed for men to picture a specific aspect of the gospel. So ladies, okay, uh, the picture that you're given is respect, okay? It's a submission to authority is what it is because the husband is called the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. How does that reflect the heart of God? Man, think about Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Did he respect and submit to the Father's authority? Yeah, he's praying. He knows what's about to happen to him. And he says over and over again, Father, if there's any way, take this cup from me. Don't pour out your wrath from sin on me. If there's any way, make this cup pass from me. But not my will, but your will be done. He said, I only do what I see the Father doing. He was completely submitted. So when you respect, when you submit to your husband, every single time you do it, you're proclaiming the respect and the submission of Jesus before God every time to your husband, to your children, to those around you. It's a unique aspect of the character of God that is only shown in your act of obedience, in your role. It's unique to you. It's something to steward. It's something to be proud of. It's something to be excited of because you get to proclaim the gospel in that unique aspect every time you walk in it. Husbands, you're the same way. Now, I said for the women, it's a picture of Gethsemane. Hey, men, how about your unique role to love your wives and give give yourself up for as Christ loved the church? Where does your picture take us to? It takes us to Calvary. You know what I'm saying? It takes us to the, the foot of the cross. That's where it takes us. That's the picture. You understand what I'm saying? And you're called to do that no manner, no matter what the manner of respect or submission is from the other person. Unique aspects of the character of God that we're called to steward. Second slide. Your choice. Cycle of gain or cycle of pain. It should be like a rap group or something. We have a generation right now I would have to say, of apathetic husbands and angry wives. 
When I say an apathetic husband, what is every sitcom about men? What does it teach us about men? They go to work, they come home, they sit in the recliner, they drink a beer, they watch a ball game. And they feel like they fulfilled their duty. Is there some truth in that picture? Yeah, or else it wouldn't exist. Men, uh, fathers and dads and husbands, we're made fun of in popular culture because of that. We've also got a generation of very angry wives. You know why? Because we're both broken. In the context of a marriage where we don't fulfill our role, a disrespected husband, I'm telling you all right now, a continually disrespected husband becomes an apathetic husband. He gets tired of fighting. He retreats to the couch. And he doesn't put up a fight anymore. He gives up. Why? Because he needed the respect. And he needs the respect because it's the way that God made him. And a wife that's angry, you got to look past the anger. That's a wife that's hurt. That's a wife that's broken. Why? Because she needs love. She doesn't just want it like a material possession. She has to have it. Now, some of you guys read the, uh, you read the love languages? You read the love languages? There's a principle in there called the love tank. You remember the love tank? I thought that was a trip. My wife and I were having a little conversation one time. You know what I mean by conversation? Spirited fellowship. <laughs> and she looked at me and she said something I'll never forget. She said, my love tank's just empty. And with all the spiritual humility and godliness and righteousness that I had in me, I thought to myself, well, my love tank ain't exactly overflowing either. <laughs> now, what's the point? But see, the way that marriage works is that when you, when you make that deposit, when a husband loves his wife, what does that produce in a wife? A desire to respect. And when a wife gives respect to a husband, what does that produce in a husband? A desire to love. And you see, those two things start feeding each other, and the marriage works really, really, really well because his needs and her needs are both being met. You understand what I'm saying? It's a really good cycle. Okay, That's the way God designed it. The problem is that when one withholds love, what does the other want to do a lot of times through the flesh? Withhold respect. And when one withholds respect, what does the other want to do through the flesh? Withhold love. And that cycle like gets broke and explodes and falls off the, you know, the, the train goes completely off the tracks and it's derailed. And they start hurting each other through not fulfilling their roles. Y'all, does it have to be that way in a Christian marriage? Nope. Because your capacity to love and respect is not contingent on the other person. You always, always, always have the ability to draw a line in the sand and through the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit to fulfill your role no matter what the other person does. And that is what takes a derailed relationship and puts it back on the right path. Take your responsibility. Don't worry about the other person. Fulfill your responsibility. And let God and the other person, let them deal with that in the context of your relationship. You have no right and you have no ability to demand of the other person. Now, last caveat, and, and hopefully I've said this you know, enough so that y'all got the picture. I, I am aware that there are gray area situations in relationships. Okay, I'm not advocating remaining under sexual, physical, emotional abuse, any of those types of things, y'all got to hear my heart in this. I'm talking about the picture. I'm talking about the big picture, okay? And y'all got some of that other stuff. We can sit down and talk about it. Third one, we need to consider all needs in marriage, physical, spiritual, and emotional, every aspect of who we are as human beings. God said the two will become one flesh. It means they're joined together in every way we're created, physically, spiritually, and emotionally, Okay? Now, would y'all be willing to admit that we have different physical, spiritual, and emotional needs? Yes, okay? Be aware of that. Understand, one, you know, one of the things that you can learn from the love languages, I didn't really like the love tank principle because I think it teaches us sometimes that we can't love when we're not filled up with love. 
And I say, you know, I, I call bull on that, okay? Because I say it's because of the power of the Holy Spirit that we can fulfill that role, not just based on what the other person does. But I do think it's wise to look at the other person and determine what are their needs, and to recognize that their needs may be different than your needs, so you can respond to them, love them, and respect them in a way that's unique to them and in a way that's fulfilling to them. All right, fourth one. The goal of sex and marriage, naked and unashamed. Naked and unashamed. That is the goal of sex in marriage. What is that picture that Paul gives us in 1 Corinthians 7? What does it teach us? It teaches us service. It teaches us sacrifice. It kind of promotes this picture where you as a husband or you as a wife would learn the other person so well and would know them so much better than anybody else would and would serve them in such a capacity that why would you want to go anywhere else? Nobody else is going to know you that well. No one else is going to love you that well. No one else is going to serve you in that manner because other people are going to take. They're going to take, okay? And that's also a place where, well, simply, you can be unashamed. That's supposed to be a place of security, where we think the best of each other, where we love each other the best, where we think the best of one another and our intentions and our motives and all those things. Here's the last one. Sex is not bad. Immorality is. Okay? Husbands and wives, y'all got to listen to me. And and even some of you other folks, you know, you're not married yet, whatever the case may be. The unfortunate byproduct of talking about sex always in a negative context is that I talk to couples that even when they get married, they go in with a sense of guilt and shame because they've been programmed for 20, 30 years to think it's bad. It's hard to flip the switch, and just because the pastor says, I now pronounce you husband and wife, and all of a sudden you think, hey, it's good now. It was bad then, it's good now. It's bad like five seconds ago. Now it's good. It's hard to do that. It's a good thing. There should be no guilt. There should be no shame. If you have any of those thoughts, you've got to be able to take those things captive and make them obedient to Christ. But you know what? There's some threats to a healthy relationship too. And men, I'd say the predominant one is pornography and just flat out laziness. Because you're not willing to put forth the effort to serve. And that impacts your physical relationship with your wife. All the other outlets for that sexual, you know, that that sexual energy, they're all designed to say you need different, you need something else, you need something. They're all designed to feed selfishness, not servitude. They're negative. They're outside of God's plan. They're a threat. For women... It's not necessarily, you know, pornography is growing with everybody, not just men, women as well. But a lot of it is fantasy too. You know, kind of the expectation of what the husband's supposed to be and how they're supposed to act and how they're supposed to treat you and things of that nature. Fatigue, we get tired. But again, we're called to servitude. And for both of you, and this is the last piece of advice I'll give for today. I tell couples all the time, you need to communicate very clearly. We talk about so many other things in our lives. We talk about every aspect of relationship, and we talk about them in detailed terms. So I tell couples, if I can give you one piece of advice that I think is probably more important than all the others, here's what I'd say. Talk about sex and express your feelings about it and talk about it openly. Like what? Like talk about it? Like, there are words that, you know, no, I can't can't say those words. (laughs) You need to start saying those words. Have awkward conversations. Get real with each other, okay? Get it out on the table and talk about it and make it a place that you talk about just like every other aspect of your life because that's a place where God wants to bless you in your marriage and he wants to use it to protect you. And in all these things, the roles, the order, the, the spiritual authority structure, the marriage bed, all of these things. I want you just to reflect that these are pictures of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's for all of us. Married, single, whatever the case may be. These are pictures that we all need to realize what they stand for, where they come from, and help us reflect the heart of God. I thank you guys for your attention. This is an important topic to me. 
because I've just seen so much destruction through it. And I see it all the time in the church. And I hope y'all hear that in me, that I have a desire that this would be something that God would bless in lives in our church. Let me pray for you. Father God, I pray for the men and women that are here, that these truths would resonate with them. I pray that they wouldn't hear, wouldn't have heard anything that I didn't say. And that, Father, if there's any place where they kind of they push back, well, Father, first, I guess I, I pray that you would clarify for them if they're pushing back on the words of man or on the words of God, because those are two very different things. And if there's anywhere in us that we would push back on your word, well, then, Father, bring us back into alignment. No matter what's happened in the past or what beliefs we've picked up or even what things have been done to hurt us, bring us back to a place of obedience. And, Father, just bless our marriages. Just bless our marriages in this place for the sake of the husbands and wives, for the sake of the children, and for the sake of the gospel and the picture that these relationships represent. May they fight for their marriages. May they fight for their wives and fight for their husbands. And may this picture be the foundation of that. For the single people that are in here today, I pray that these truths would be things that would build a foundation in them that would, well, that would help them for years to come. I spoke to a couple earlier today who have been married for, I think, 57 years. Would you, through your Holy Spirit and the power of transformation that you cause, use some of this truth to create some other 57-year marriages in this place, and a bunch of them, that we as a church could celebrate those things, like we celebrate the, the, you know, the, the committal of children before you. And Father, I thank you for what you've designed for us. And we pray all these things in the name of Christ. Amen.